Hello, everyone. Welcome again. Um, I'm Matthew Sample, Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation uh, at Leibniz University Hanover. Um, thanks for joining us for today's event uh, in our speaker series, Literary Imagination in Science, Technology, and Society. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn, who's at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, she uh, chose the theme for our series and has been using her amazing connections and network to bring um, not only scholars, but also writers and novelists to, to speak with us about uh, what we think is a really important topic. So the motivation for the series um, is an obvious fact, but it's a consequential one. And that's that imagination and storytelling are a core part of uh, science and technology, especially in modern modernity. Um, on a very basic level, storytelling allows science and technology to exist because stories are a way for us to coordinate our um, activities with one another to help us explain what we value in life. Um, and then it's also, I think, narrative is a way by which technical practices come to have social meaning outside of the lab. So if we don't have stories about science and technology, then we don't have understandings of science and tech. So for this reason, uh, we're, we've brought together um, thinkers and writers in academia and beyond to help us answer questions like how do narratives shape the impact of science and technology in our daily lives? And how can narrative be used to reimagine and reform institutional forms of science despite its connections to uh, power and oppression? So uh, today I'd like to welcome our speaker, Wei Ki Wong, who is the author of Chemistry and the forthcoming novel, Joan is Okay with Random House Press. She's the recipient of the 2018 Penn Hemingway uh, Whiting Award and a National Book Foundation 535. Her work has appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Plowshares, and The New Yorker, among other publications. She's in the 2019 Best American Short Stories and O. Henry Prizes. She earned her MFA from Boston University and her other degrees from Harvard. She currently lives in New York City and teaches at UPenn and Barnard. So welcome, Wiki. Thank you. Thank you, Anna and Matthew, for having me. I'm excited. So um, I guess I'll hand it over to you for our first reading um, from chemistry. And if there's anything you want to um, frame or tell us ahead of time, um, we're open to that too. <laughs> sure. Um, so chemistry was um, my MFA thesis when I when I went into do my MFA at BU um, and I was lucky enough to work with some great writers and advisors um, like Hajin and Sigrid Nunez and they helped me sort of get this book off the ground um, and it became chemistry. Um, so for the first reading I'll read about 10 pages from the beginning of chemistry and then um, we'll talk about maybe chemistry and other you know backgrounds of uh, me and writing um, and then I'll go into a little bit of Jonas okay to kind of give you a sense of um, what I've been writing lately and what I've been thinking about. Um, so this is just the start of chemistry. I actually haven't read this in a couple years. So this is kind of nice to come back to this. Um, the boy asks the girl a question. It is a question of marriage. Ask me again tomorrow, she says. And ask me again tomorrow, she says. And he says, that's not how this works. Diamond is no longer the hardest mineral known to man. New scientist reports that lancelite is. Lancelite is 58% harder than diamond and forms only when meteorites smash themselves into earth. The lab mate says to make a list of pros and cons. Write it all down, prove it to yourself. She then nods sympathetically and pats me on the arm. The lab mate is a solver of hard problems. Her desk is next to mine, but is neater and more result producing. Big deal, she says, of her many, many publications and doesn't take herself too seriously. Is busy, but not that busy. Talks about things other than chemistry. I find her outlook refreshing yet strange. If I were that accomplished, I would casually bring up my published papers in conversation. Have you read so-and-so? Because it is quite worth your time. The tables alone are beautiful and well formatted. I have only one table. I have only one paper out. The tables are in fact very beautiful all clear and double spaced line borders, all succinct and informative titles. Somewhere I read that the average number of readers for a scientific paper is 0 0.6. So I make a list. The pros are extensive. 
Eric cooks dinners, Eric cooks great dinners. Eric hands me the toothbrush with toothpaste on it and sometimes even sticks it in my mouth. Eric takes out the trash, the recycling, waters all our plants because I can't seem to remember that they're living things. These leaves feel crunchy, he said after the week that he was gone. He goes that week to California for a conference with other young and established chemists. Also, Eric drives me to lab when it's too rainy to bike. Boston sees a great deal of rain. Sometimes the rain comes down horizontal and hits the face. Also, Eric walks the dog. We have a dog. Eric got him for him. Eric got him for me. I realize that I don't have any cons. I knew this going in. It is a half list, I tell the lab mate the next day, and she offers to buy me a cookie. In lab, there are two boxes filled with argon. It is where I do highly sensitive chemistry, the kind that can never see air. Once air is let in, the chemicals catch fire. It is also where I wish to put my head on days of nothing going right. On those days, I add the wrong amount of catalyst, or I add the wrong catalyst. Catalysts make reactions go faster. They lower activation energy, which is the indecision each reaction faces before committing to its path. What use is this work in the long run, I ask myself, in the room when I am alone? The solvent room, officially, but I have renamed it the Fortress of Solitude. Eric is no longer in this lab. He graduated last year and is now in another lab. A chemistry PhD takes at least five years to complete. We met when I was in my first and he was in his second. Now I walk around our apartment and trip over his stuff, big black drum bags and steel pots and carboys with brown liquid fermenting inside. Eric plays the drum and brews beer. One con is how much space these two hobbies take up, but this is outweighed by the drums that I like to hear and the beer that I like to drink. My pearl list grows at an exponential rate. We had talked about marriage before. Can you see yourself settling down, having kids? Can you see yourself starting a family? I didn't say no, but I didn't say yes. We had these talks casually. Each time he thought if he actually, if actually proposed to, I would say something different. At least now all my cards are on the table, he says, but please don't take too long to decide. It has been the summer of unbearable heat. At the Home Depot, we go up and down aisles looking for a fan. Our last fan broke yesterday and next week it is, and next week it is supposed to be hotter than next month, a hurricane. When Eric sees the hurricane report, he wonders if the people who wrote it are just screwing with us. Why would they do that? I ask, because it's funny. All right. Then a minute later, I laugh. Patience is Eric's greatest virtue. He will wait in longer lines than I will and think nothing of it. He will smile while holding a heavy fan at the older woman in the front in front of him who has brought a tall stack of lampshades and at the moment of payment is having second thoughts. She asks the clerk for his opinion. She asks Eric, do I need the magenta? Me, she doesn't bother with because I am the one with the furiously tapping foot. The woman considers some more, turning each lampshade in her hands, but in the end purchases nothing. I tell Eric in the car that if I were to reimagine hell, it'd be no different from the line we were just in, except the woman would never decide on a lampshade and the line would never move. Can you imagine, I say, a worse punishment than pushing that thing up the hill? A boulder, Eric says. I realize what a hypocrite I'm being to make him wait for an answer and then dwell on a 25 minute line. Once home, Eric sets the fan up and the dog goes crazy. Two years ago, Eric and I moved in together. We do not have a dog, but we were thinking about it. What kind, Eric asked, big, small, I don't have a preference. How about just adorable? When he first brings him home, I hear the tail, long and bushy, thumping against the couch. A 45 pound golden doodle, incredibly adorable. When he runs, his ears flop. If we never groomed him, his hair would keep growing and he would look like a blonde bear. The blonde bear loves people and this is good. But then we discover that he is afraid of everything else, the hair dryer, an empty box, the fan. Bad tempers run in my family. It is the dominant allele like black hair. Eric has red hair. Our friends have asked if there's any way our babies will turn out to be gingers. Gingers are dying out and our friends are concerned about Eric's beautiful locks. I say, unless Mendel was completely wrong about genetics, our babies will have my hair but our friends can still dream, an Asian baby with red hair. One friend says, you could write a science paper on that and then apply for academic jobs and then get tenure. Eric is already looking for academic jobs. 
he wants to teach at a college that primarily serves undergrads because they are the future, he says, eager to learn, energetic, happy, more or less, as compared with grad students. With undergrads, I can make a real difference. I don't say this, but I think it. You are the only person I know who talks like that, so enthusiastically and benefit of the doubt giving. But the colleges he's interested in are not in Boston. They're in places like Oberlin, Ohio. I'm certain that Eric will get the job. His career path is very straight, like that of an arrow to its target. If I were to draw my path out, it would look like a gas particle flying around in space. The lab mate often echoes the wisdom of many chemists before her. You must love chemistry even when it's not working. You must love chemistry unconditionally. The friends who ask about the red haired babies are the ones who recent are the ones recently married or the ones recently married with a dog. Whenever we have them over for dinner, like tonight, they think we are trying to tell them that we're engaged. News, they say. Not yet, I reply but here have some freshly grated Parmesan cheese instead. Behind my back, I know they are less kind. They ask each other, it's been four years, hasn't it? They joke, she's only with him for his money. It is common knowledge now that grad students make close to nothing and there are more PhD scientists in this country than there are jobs for them. When Eric first decides to do a PhD, it is in high school. He takes a chemistry class and excels. This is in Western Maryland in a town with many steeple churches, but no Starbucks. Every other year, we drive three hours from a DC airport through a gap in the Appalachian Mountains and arrive at a picturesque place where Eric seems to know everyone. He waves to the man across the horseshoe bar, his former band teacher. He waves to the woman at the post office, the mother of a high school friend. The diner with the horseshoe bar is called Niners. There's always farmland for sale and working mills. Sometimes I wonder why he left a place where every ice cream shop is called a creamery to work 70 hours a week, to work 70 hour weeks in lab. He credits the chemistry teacher who asked him often, what are you going to do afterwards? And don't just say stick around. A belief among Chinese mothers is that children pick their own traits in the womb. The smart ones work diligently to pick the better traits. The dumb ones get easily flustered and fall asleep. For their laziness, they are then dealt the worst traits. Or perhaps this is just a belief of my own mother. Had you chosen better, you would have not ended up with your father's terrible temper or my poor vision. I don't want to believe this, but it has become so ingrained. Compared with mine, Eric's temper is non-existent. Thursday, trash day, we pick the wrong streets to go down and drive for miles behind a garbage truck. It is a one-way road. It is also a one-lane road. But not once does he sigh or complain. He puts on jazz music instead. Listen to this, he says, and all I hear is the going and stopping of the truck, the picking up and dumping of trash, the clanking of metal bins. So frustrated am I after one song that I lean over and press the horn for him. Then out the window, I shout at the truck, excuse me, do you mind? The PhD student, sorry, the PhD advisor visits my desk, sits down, brings his hands together and asks, where do you see your project going in five years? Five years, I say in disbelief. I would hope to be graduated by then and in the real world with a job. I see, he says, perhaps then it is time to start a new project, one that is more within your capabilities. He leaves me to it. The desire to throw something at his head never goes away. Depending on what he says, it is either the computer or the desk. I sketch out possible projects. Alchemy for one, if I could achieve that today, I could graduate tomorrow. A guy in lab strongly believes that women do not belong in science. He said that women lack the balls to actually do science, which isn't wrong, we do lack balls. But if he had said that to me at the start of grad school, I would have punched him. Coming in, I think myself the best at chemistry. In high school, I win a national award for it. I say cockily at orientation, yes, that was me only to realize that everyone else had won it as well at some point, in addition to awards I've never won. This lab guy is still around. He works with a lab mate. If all goes well, they will have another paper next year and then they will graduate. Women lack, ball, la women lack the balls to do science, he still says, with the exception of your lab mate, she has three. Later, I asked Eric, how many balls do you think I have? It's poor timing. We have just gotten into bed and started to kiss. Uh, none, he says, and the kissing is over. 
I was hoping he would have said something along the lines of three and a half. A Chinese proverb, outside of sky, there is sky, outside of people, there are people. It's the idea of infinity and also that there will always be someone better than you. Eric says the proverb reminds him of, reminds him of a story from Indian philosophy. 300 years ago, the world was believed to be flat, to be a flat plate that rested on an elephant that rested on a turtle. Below that turtle was another turtle and below that turtle was another one. It was turtles all the way down. Thank you. Hello? Hi. <laughs> well, thank you so much for reading the first- Of course. The first of the 11 pages of chemistry. Yeah. Um, so a note before we launch into a discussion, um, I think how we're gonna structure the questions from the audience will be at the end. So even if okay. you have specific questions um, about each of the texts, maybe we could wait for it um, until the bigger discussion happens because there'll be a, another reading for the forthcoming novel. So um, you should send that to me by a chat, via chat because I can collect it that way and I can see if there are like common themes, I can synthesize it so that we can have a really robust discussion without so much repetition. Um, so, Vicky, I wanted to ask you first about the question of a genre. And yeah. I'm thinking about genre because um, last, I think two weeks ago, we had Asako Zerazawa, the author of Inheritors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as you know, the title of the lecture series is Literary Imagination. And when it comes to like topics of science and technology, some for, I mean, for obvious reasons, the genre of sci-fi is always immediately thought of. And um, when we crafted the, the speaker series, we didn't want so much a big focus on sci-fi, but we did want to talk about how authors do use science and technology, whether that is in um, fiction stories or future stories, but not necessarily sci-fi. So for yours, um, it's a nice contrast with Asako's because she she has some future stories set in the future, but she doesn't like to call them sci-fi. She probably yeah. says like it's more speculative, but not so much sci-fi. Right, but, right. But for yours, it's and I know it's a really hated genre term, autofiction, kind of like autoethnography people, authors. No, I love like actually autofiction. Oh, you I, do? <laughs> I teach a class on autofiction. I love it. Yeah, so like so if if your if your book is imagined as some sort of um, observation on life in the lab and then kind of the academic crisis. So you, in the first 11 pages that you read, you already mentioned kind of different attitudes of scientists in training or not. So there's this, the nameless narrator is still, mm -hmm. a, still a student and there's a sense of like dry humor, even though the narrator right. tries to make sense of life using chemistry language, right. but it's also a pushback about against what she has learned in the lab. And then you have your, the lab mate who's very accomplished. So she publishes a lot, but she doesn't seem to care that much. And then mm -hmm. the, uh, the narrator even says, um, no one reads scientific papers anyway, despite big, like a lot of publication. Right. And then right. Eric is like the perennial optimist, right? He thinks yes. his life calling is to teach undergrads about chemistry. So there are like a lot of fluctuating attitudes about this academic job market, um, lack of job prospects. So could you tell us why you wanted to write um, your first novel about life in the lab and as an academic? Yeah. Um, well, just to, I think the first novel is always the, I was speaking for myself and some other you know writers I know, the first novel is sometimes the easiest novel to write because you've been carrying around the story for so long. Um, now that chemistry is sort of a few years behind me and I'm onto kind of Joan, um, chemistry was largely based on my, was somewhat rough undergrad experience in organic synthesis lab. Um, so I, I went to undergrad at Harvard um, and I had minored in chemistry, um, or not minored, I majored in chemistry and minored in English. Um, and Harvard being what it is as a school, um, you're sort of very pressured to do the research and et cetera. So I was in lab probably four years out of, you know, my four years of undergrad. Um, and during that time, I was really kind of in, inserted into sort of the chemistry world of chemists and graduate student chemists and just graduate student scientists because the chemistry bio departments are actually very close in biochemistry. Um, and it's such a wild field. Um, and what I, 
sort of started to notice about scientists is that, you know, the, the stereotype of scientists either being the mad scientist, right? Or sort of the objective, clinical, very reasonable scientist, logical scientist. Those are two extremes that don't really exist in the lab. I feel like scientists are just, you know, they're, they're, they're human beings. They're very complex. They're very nuanced. They are combative, they're loving, they're endearing, they're difficult. Um, and they're also really interesting to think about and, and sort of write stories about. Um, so I was really inspired by kind of just like the stories I was seeing, these, these, some of these poor grad students um, of kind of their trajectory in the lab and sort of what lab work, work was for them. And I think I'm just drawn to sort of intensity of work in a certain level. And I saw that in the science lab to a certain degree. Um, and that's kind of why I picked the protagonist, Joan. She's an ICU doctor. So I, it's the same sort of um, kind of obsession that I have with work, seeing people working, especially women in STEM fields working um, and sort of showing that work because I think demonstrating work is important that these people work really hard and they sort of have a lot on the line. Um, and yes, it's science. And yes, um, maybe it's not always written about, but it's actually quite fascinating if you can sort of get it on the page. Um, and I see your point about kind of autofiction. That's something I think about a lot of kind of taking, you know, this is definitely not my experience because I didn't go to chemistry grad school, but, be, but you could imagine it. You can imagine the world um, and sort of putting my perspective on it, like sort of dropping myself into that world. Um, so that's sort of a voice that I always really like to inhabit. Um, and I do take, you know, I, I do feel very inspired by works in auto fiction. It's just fiction gives you such a great protection. And so, you know, the idea that a, fict a fictional story can be 99% fiction and 1% true or 99%, you know, true and 1% fiction, no one would know. Sort of that's the great ability of that art is to, you're, you're, it's so malleable and you can kind of form it in different ways to maybe get the message that you want across. Um, but yeah, that, uh, something that, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, the, the next class I'm teaching, I think next year is something about like writing real science or how to write incorporate science into literature. I find it's really hard to think about fiction and science without someone mentioning, well, what about science fiction? Um, and that is slightly different. And I, I do see the difference there um, because science fiction, you know, Honestly, I, I just don't have the skills for science fiction. I find actually having kind of gone through the grinder of science, the field to be somewhat, you know, very, very logical in terms of its principles that I actually don't have the imagination to sort of write about like flying cars or, you know, time travel or things where I would just get up lost in the logistics of it, like how quantumly would this work, um, that I couldn't do it. And I wish I could sometimes, but I think some, that it's, it's sort of like learning the science of you know my training sort of erased a lot of the magic for science for me but then writing about science and fiction actually rejuvenated a lot of my love for it and that's sort of what I really loved about chemistry and just reading chemistry right now kind of coming back to it um the mixing of you know science and fiction it, it's really writing this book was kind of my rediscovering what I really liked about basic science um during a time where I was not quite sure if I like that field anymore. So do I have enough time to ask another question about chemistry? <laughs> He's keeping time, so I have to be really yeah. diligent. Yeah. Um, my other question, and maybe to the audience members who have who either has read it or has not read it, I might spoil it a bit, but um, it's a broad enough question that maybe we won't spoil too much. So a lot of chemistry too, it's maybe what's not explicitly said is about kind of um, the Asian minority myth represented in STEM fields. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you keep up with the discourse, whether that's um, within academic circles or on academic Twitter, you kind of see this idea of representation. Yeah. It's like some people have criticized as being shallow, like if you just put a non white person in any of the STEM fields, that's a form of representation that could be a win. But yeah. um, I feel like chemistry kind of troubles that notion because it's the narrator's parents who are very insistent that the, the narrator finish, right? Like right. they have a lot of hopes right. pinned onto the, their daughter. So yeah. um, when you're writing chemistry or even reflecting now because it's been about three years since it's been published, yeah. 
Like, no, thank God. I mean, I love the time <laughs> that you get from projects. You get to like it a little bit more. <laughs> more. That's really good. Sometimes I feel pretty sad when I hear people say like, I don't want to talk about that project anymore, but it's always yeah, nice well, to be retrospective about it. Yeah, it, so. because you, you just learn a better appreciation for it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so your question is about the sort of the model minority myth yeah, and so, the sense of representation. Yeah. Do you see the discourse shifting in any sense or um, mm -hmm. are we kind of still stuck in like what could move beyond representation? <laughs> what would that even look like in a STEM field? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it's a very tricky question. I mean, I think I primarily I'm interested in sort of protagonists in these fields because these are the fields that um, it, it's sort of, the, I, I, you know, in a way nostalgia, but is also kind of the world that I grew up in. Um, the idea of the, the model minority myth, sometimes I think about that phrase and I'm like, is it a myth? Is it not a myth? Because if I don't represent it or if I don't at least acknowledge it, I'm sort of erasing someone like, you know, my dad, who's like an engineer and sort of was a very good employee for like many, many years, um, or someone like me who sort of went through the, the hoops to just to make sure that I had some sort of like a backup plan, right? There's always this like backup plan that in case, you know, um, things um, like hit troubled water. So um, I, I, I sort of use protagonists to really explore that, right? I mean, the the poor representation would just be have this, 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 you know, chemist or Joan be every single stereotype without any sort of engagement in it, without any sort of humor, sympathy, um, endearing qualities, or just a, a sense of understanding um, of why these characters exist and what forces created these characters. Um, now that I've had some time away from chemistry, I think about myself as sort of Am I representative of, of like you know Asian Americans or Asians? I I don't think so because I don't know how many Asians go and get a PhD in like biostats and then decide to write. You know, I mean, I think that's just not necessarily the trajectory that most people would go down. But those are a lot of the people I do know, and I am interested in kind of writing about their stories and sort of giving them a treatment that's kind of more nuanced and f fuller and sort of fair in terms of, you know, I want to be sympathetic, but I also want to be kind of um, honest about some of the flaws that becoming this kind of person in a career path like this does to you. You know, um, there's a lot of editing down. There's a lot of, you have to fit this mold. Um, and it's not because they like to do it. It's just a training process that unfortunately they're put through. Um, and that's something that I kind of understand pretty well, um, that if you're a minority and not the dominant culture, you have to fit the mold instead of, you know, you, you are not the mold, right? You have to fit the mold that they give you. Sorry about that. So, Wakey, I guess we'll transition into your next reading. Um, sure. So maybe we'll make more connections with the two novels. Yeah, great. Um, so this is the first 10 pages of Joan is OK. Um, you don't need that much background um, about Joan, um, but she is a doctor, and this is sort of the start of her story. Um, when I think about people, I think about space, how much space a person takes up and how much use that person provides. I'm just under five feet tall and just under a hundred pounds. Briefly, I thought I would exceed five feet. And while that would have been fine, I also didn't need the extra height. To stay just under something gives me a sense of comfort as when it rains and I can open an umbrella over my head. Today, someone said that I look like a mouse, five, six and 290 pounds. He in a backless gown with non-slip tube socks said that my looking like a mouse made him wary. He asked how old I was, what schools had I gone to, and were these were they prestigious? Then where were my degrees from these prestigious schools? My degrees are large and framed, I said. I don't carry them around. While not a mouse, I do have prosaic features, my eyes hooded and lashless. I have everything eyebrows. I told the man that he could try another hospital or come back at another time the high chance that I would still be here and he would still think that I look like a mouse. 
I read somewhere that empathy is repeating the last three words of a sentence and nodding your head. My 20s were spent in school and a girl in her 20s is said to be in her prime. After that decade, all is lost. They must mean looks because what could a female brain be worth and how long could one last? Being in school often felt like a race. I was told to grab time and if I didn't, that is reach out the window and pull time in like a messenger dove, someone else in another car would. The road was full of cars, limousines and Priuses, but there were a limited number of doves. With this image in mind, I can no longer ride in a vehicle with the windows down. Inevitably, I will look for the dove and offer my hand out to be cut off. My father's stroke was fatal, having followed the natural course of a stroke of that magnitude to its predictable end. Usually people die from complications and I was grateful he hadn't. Complications would have angered him actually to have died not from a single blow, but from a total system shutdown, which was slower, more painful and revealed just how vulnerable a person could be. Months prior, he had complained of headaches and eye pressure. I told him to get some tests done and he said he would, which meant he wouldn't. In China, my father ran a construction company that in the last decade had finally seen success. He was a typical workaholic and for most of my childhood, adolescence, adulthood, not often around. When I got the news, I was in my office at the hospital at work. My friend, sorry, my father had tripped over a bundle of projector cords during a meeting and bounced his head off a chair. As my mother was explaining, either the fall triggered the stroke or the stroke triggered the fall, I asked her to put the phone next to his ear. He was already unconscious, but hearing is the last sense to go. Given the time difference on my side, only morning in Manhattan since I was 12 hours ahead, my father was still en route to the meeting that by my mother's account was meant to be ordinary. I asked my father how his drive was going and if he could just for today, take a few hours off. He obviously didn't reply, but I said, either way, this one, I was proud of him. He had never planned to retire and remained until the very end doing what he loved. Twang, I said, into the phone and raised my fist into the air. After my mother hung up, I sat there for a while, not facing the computer, and that was my mistake. Having seen my fist go up, the other two doctors in the office asked whom I'd been talking to and what was that strange sound I just made. I said my father and that the sound was closer to a word, but the word meant nothing. My colleagues didn't know I spoke Chinese, and I wanted to keep it that way to avoid any confusion. But the word did mean something. It had many different definitions, one of which was to begin. It was late September and my female colleague Madeline was teasing my male colleague Reese about summer, which was his favorite season, so he was sad to see it go. Only little girls like summers, Madeline said to Reese, little girls in flower dresses, flower crowns, and paisley dresses. Reese was a 6'2", 190 pound, all American guy who went on casual dates with lots of women, but flirted with only Madeline at work. I'm madly in love with you, he said, he would say to her in front of other colleagues like me. And Madeline would either ignore him completely or relentlessly try to get him back. Madeline was a 5'7", 139 pound robust German woman with a slight accent. She has had the same software engineer boyfriend for seven years and they lived in an apartment with lots of plants. What's wrong, Madeline asked, sensing that I had been turned away from my monitor for too long. I asked if one of them could cover my weekend shift. I apologized for the short notice, but I had to leave. Both were happy to do it and even commended my requests, since like my father, I was a workaholic and known to never take time off. They asked where I was going, and I said China, but just for the weekend. Then I turned from them and started packing up my things. Fine, don't tell us, said Reese. I know what it is, Madeline said with a mischievous glint. You're off to get married. You're going to elope. Elope is a funny word and in hospital speak for patients meant to leave the building at the risk of yourself and without a doctor's consent. After I mentioned my father's passing, Madeline gasped, covering her mouth and for a second shutting her eyes. Through her fingers, she asked if that had been my last conversation with him and the sound I made, was it then a sound of grief? I said, no, not really and left it at that. Reese and Madeline asked me a few more questions, like when I last saw him, and how long has it been since I left China? You were born there, no? Reese asked, and I said I was born in the Bay Area. California, Madeline said, a great place to be born. But Oakland, I said, to not seem like I was giving my birthplace too much credit. Right, Reese said. Still, Madeline said, 
I told them that the last time I saw my father was in spring. He had been in New York for business, a possible opportunity here, a new client. And on his way back to JFK, drove past the hospital and met me in its first floor atrium that had fake greenery and a small cafe. He bought me a cup of coffee and I was almost done with it when he had to leave and catch his flight. But to China, I rarely went, nor did I consider myself too Chinese. The moment those words left my mouth, I wondered why I had said them, what was wrong with being too Chinese. Yet it always seemed that something was. I felt a draft, but that was impossible. Our shared office was a windowless room with a dozen desks lined up against the wall and refreshments in the back. The door opened to a hall that had no windows, had no open windows and was used only to transport equipment a folded up wheelchair, an empty bed pushed by hunched over text. Madeline asked if I wanted some gum and it seemed we all did. So we passed the gum packet around and discussed the fresh minty flavor. She asked if I wanted the rest of the pack. International, fl international flights are long. How long exactly? I said 16 hours to which Reese replied, shit. I was, a, I was surprised that neither asked where in China I was going. The country was huge and much of it rural. Google, Google Maps didn't work there, but there were only two cities most people knew about, and I was going not to the capital, but the other one by the sea. I met my only brother at JFK later that night. Eight years older, he was in what he called the new and fit middle age. It didn't matter to him what age I was, 36. I was younger, would always be, and he liked to tell me what to do. Fung was rich now, his Connecticut house massive. Since he had arranged the travel, we boarded first class where I had a small room by myself, my seat the size of a one person L-shaped sectional with a divider to my left that pulled open and closed. For the hour before takeoff, my brother visited me in my room to talk about how great first class amenities were, the meals and service, different options of heated blankets, ability to recline and lie down, the late octane bathroom kit, blue pajamas with red piping, Things our father never had nor could appreciate because he grew up in a village, I said. It wasn't a village, Fong said. A small town in the countryside, yes, but not a village. Don't talk about things you don't understand. Then Fong explained the layout 10 kit. He opened his bag and held each item out between his two index fingers. This was a mini tube of toothpaste. This was a retractable comb, earplugs, moisturizer, and cologne, tiny powerful mints. He promised that once I flew, flew first class, I would never be the same. There was no other way to travel. When the meals came, we ate them in our respective rooms with silverware and drank our glass flutes of Vivid Clicquot. From across the aisle, Fong asked when I would be getting promoted at work. And I said I was already an attending slash the most senior person in the room. Sure, he said, but it doesn't, it can't hurt to ask. There's gotta be one position higher. I said, probably. He replied, most definitely. Then we finished the champagne and gave back our meal trays and prepared for sleep. But for the entirety of the flight, I didn't sleep. I didn't use the Leoctan kit or my blue pajamas. By accident, I pushed the call button and soon a pretty Asian flight attendant came by to ask if I needed fresh towels for my face or help with my recline. Her teeth were very white and she said that a total recline was what these chairs were built to do, to go flat like a twin size bed and provide passengers maximum support. Unbelievable to me that she could smile and talk at the same time, a task I thought humanly impossible. When I didn't have a request for her, the pretty attendant reclined my sectional, pull, pull closed my room divider again, and dimmed the lights. Waiting for us at Pudong Airport was our mother with newly permed hair, a colorful crossbody purse, and ankles that shimmered from her translucent silk socks. My mother liked to break my name into two syllables, Jonah, she said, and assessed my shoulder. During residency, I had lost the weight of a forearm. I'd since gained it back, but my mother still liked to check and to ask if I was eating enough, if I had already eaten, if I could eat any more. Greetings between some families can be so anticlimactic. My mother and I spoke often enough through phone calls and texts, but after two years physically apart, there was no big embraces or kisses. He didn't greet Fong as he was clearly at baggage claim ahead of the, as he was already at baggage claim ahead of the crowd. I'd forgotten about crowds in China, that being in a crowd here was like being lost at sea. And for airports, train stations, for any transportation hub, any city really, for all the tourist sites, all the shopping centers, especially around the holidays, especially food markets, escalators, the phrase Zhenghai is, exists or people see. By now, 
Fong was 20 feet ahead of us at a sleek black booth calling us a private sedan. In the sedan, he gave the suited up driver with white gloves no directions. He said just the name of the hotel and the driver was off. I was trapped in with a simple handshake, hotel amenities, a three inch binder. A hundred people came to my father's funeral, most I didn't know. He had two brothers and many friends. My mother has a brother, two sisters and more friends. These uncles, these aunts and uncles I'd spent less than a week with in total for the entirety of my life. 18 years ago, my parents moved back to Shanghai and have lived there ever since. Once I was bound for college, they saw their jobs as parents complete. Fong was already established then and I was all well on my way. None of their siblings had immigrated and my parents were still not as comfortable in America as they hoped. So after they left, it was just me and my brother in the States, the rest of my immediate family abroad. At the funeral, I couldn't talk about my father in a significant way. And once I got a few words out, others just wanted me to stop. Afterwards, a small, smaller group of us gathered for dinner at an upscale restaurant in a private room. The room had a round banquet table with a lazy Susan wheel built in. Customary in this country for families to sit for hour long meals and turn this wheel back and forth, politely forcing everyone to eat. Once one meal ended, another began. Elaborate dishes were brought out, at least 10 varieties of soup. Children would run around the table, laugh hysterically and hide behind the upholstered chairs. But there was no children at this dinner and I wondered why. To the woman next to me, I asked where so-and-so was. She pointed to herself. She was this former so-and-so, my father's youngest brother's second child, now my cousin of 25. Sorry, now my cousin of 22. Oh, I said, hasn't China changed, my cousin asked. In the last 10 years, it's become brand new. I said I didn't know the country so well. She said that given how my face was Chinese, it was a shame to not know, to not, to know nothing about myself. We pushed the lazy Susan clockwise, then counterclockwise. About our country, continued my cousin, it used to be poor, but now we have caught up. We have surpassed most Western countries, even yours. She showed me her fancy leather wallet and told me the price. She passed me her new phone, which she noted was even more advanced than mine. So powerful to me what she was trying to prove, everything was erased. I told my cousin that I was very sorry for her loss. My father was a good uncle to you and a good comrade overall. Hello? Yeah. Oh, sorry, something popped up. I didn't know what it was. Okay. Well, thank you again for the um, maybe like the intro to your book because yeah. I know your book will be released in the United States at the start of next year, right? Right, right. I don't know what that means for us here in Germany, but maybe a year after. So. I'll send you a copy. If you oh, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> so I want you to begin because. Um, I'm trying to make a connection with chemistry, which is about life in the lab. And now in um, Joan is okay, we're kind of seeing um, the character. Maybe they're not the same character, but at least life outside of the lab into the world and even outside yeah. of the United States. Yeah. So um, why did you imagine starting? So this will be your second novel, right? So yeah. what, what kind of narrative now do you want to focus on that you didn't think you explored in chemistry or is this or is this like an independent project from the first book? It's definitely an independent project. Um, my editor says that Joan is like the older sister of the protagonist in chemistry. And I can kind of see that. Um, Joan throughout the novel is, right, the protagonist in chemistry has a real kind of crisis of sort of faith in her work, faith in the field, just like general self-confidence issues I think that comes from being in your 20s and that's you know when I was writing that book um Joan actually has none of these issues um the the premise of the story is really that Joan is fine and she thinks she's fine but everyone else doesn't think she's fine or they sort of feel that she's maybe not grieving her father um in the best way possible um Maybe she should get married. Maybe she had kids. Maybe she shouldn't be such a workaholic since her career is now so defined. Maybe she should get promoted even though she's like the highest level, you know, th there's always something you can do. So I think um, Joan is okay sort of following a protagonist that I think it is okay, is like mentally there, shows up to work, is sort of this like, you know, um, 
maybe not the warmest person to everyone, right, but does her job. Um, and that's sort of what you want from an ICU doctor. I think you don't necessarily want your ICU doctor to be like a socialite, right? You want them to kind of show up to work and know how to use the machines. Um, and that's what she does. And she's good at that. Um, so in this one, I sort of wanted to explore sort of the absurdity of what happens to a protagonist where um, this death of the father really kind of spirals things for her life in ways that she didn't expect. And I kind of took a page out of The Stranger, Camus' book, because I love that book. It's like one of my favorite books. Um, it's just her focus and short. And I think it kind of gets through at sort of this like true existential surrealism and also just absurdity of what could happen to your life unexpectedly um, when other people tend to project their own demands onto you as a character, even if you are fulfilling all of your own personal, I don't know, like happiness, you know, goals and things like that. Um, so that's what sort of what I was kind of trying to explore in the second book. Shweta, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself so you can ask Waiki your question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I need to do it. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, hi. Thank you so much for your writing. I really, really loved chemistry for oh, some very thanks. wonky reasons. I left medicine because I wanted to be a writer. Oh, wow. I, I actually maybe do like the sciences and it's not all my parents. So I am yeah. now doing a sort of SDSC, Trans-Asian Geographies kind of PhD um, in wow. anthropology. So I think it's an attempt to like sort of try and bring my interests and my worlds together. So something I really enjoyed about your protagonist in chemistry, which I have read and your future book, which I'm, I'm kind of getting a feeling of from what yeah. you're reading is the fact that they're always navigating between worlds, like the worlds that they were raised in, the worlds that they live in today. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how maybe love becomes a way through which you explore this in-betweenness that they seem to be navigating. And there's like love for parents, love for friends, love for a partner, but also in chemistry, the sort of unconditional love for chemistry is, or, or what is expected, right? Um, this kind of love for the sciences or, yeah. so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how love becomes uh, mm -hmm. a way through which you explore and what your inspiration is or why you see that as something that maybe brings things together, but also seems to be blowing apart these categorical stereotypes and expectations at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right, um, that's a great question. There, that, that was the line that I read about you have to love this inanimate field so passionately. Um, so with, with regards to kind of the family aspect, um, Joan, ex the second book explores that sort of fully because it is following the death of her father. Um, and for some of these characters, yeah, they're, they're really in between a lot of different worlds, a lot of different fields, a lot of kind of generational gaps. Um, and there's just no escaping that. I mean, they obviously have tremendous love for their family, but those love ties are kind of forged in this like fire, you know, they're forged in this pressure cooker of, uh, of obligation, of sort of sacrifice, of sort of like, you, you have to take care of each other because we are all we have, right? There's this codependency um, that is, um, that is so much part of the love that some of these characters are experiencing. Um, and, so love is not just kind of this like great privilege and luxury. It's also this necessity for them that, um, you know, I, that these characters love their family, their parents, their spouses, their significant others. Um, but there's also behind that love, there's also this like deep frustration and difficulty and kind of getting along with some of these conflicting, um, just conflicting ideologies. Um, and, I don't actually think there's a solution to being in the middle of a lot of things. I think it's just attention um, and then sticking through it and sort of um, just being present, you know? Um, so much of the scenes that I'm trying to depict with these people is that they love each other, but they also bother each other, right? And bothering people is so much a part of loving them. You, you just show up and then, you know, you're in their lives and you're just always in their lives. Um, 
but sometimes that's better than not being in their lives because the absence mm -hmm. would be so much worse. Um, so some of these characters are exploring that in terms of what would happen if I didn't have chemistry, you know? Uh, and by the end of chemistry, I think she's actually a little bit okay with like not totally having a certain element of chemistry in her life, um, but wanting maybe Eric back as like a friend because mm -hmm. that, that sort of presence is really important. Um, and same with Joan is her figuring out what to do with her father's absence. Um, and she never really has an issue with medicine being sort of something that she loves to do, but she's starting to realize through this big event, what her relationship with her family really is um, since she's been able to kind of exist independently without them for so long. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So I wanted to jump in and maybe um, tie some questions from the chat together and also my yeah. own question. Sure. Since we don't have a ton of time left. Um, you mentioned you were teaching a class. Yeah. Um, what was it called? Writing real science or something? Yeah, like that? I'm, I'm trying to develop. I mean, I haven't started teaching it, but like I'm trying to kind of if you have suggestions for what I should teach for reading. I would love to hear well, um, <laughs> you know, either of you. I would love to kind of think about um, science as it appears in literature, as it appears in fiction, nonfiction. That's not necessarily science fiction or genre fiction, you know? Well, so it's that's super interesting to us. Um, I'm not sure I have the I have the like the syllabus in my head already, but um, I do have something I've noticed in academia, which is after, I don't know, 200 years of sort of ignoring the practice of science, yeah. some academics have decided that the new approach should be, let's do philosophy of, of science as a practice. And they call it a practice to indicate science as it exists rather than science. Mm. Um, as an ideal. So, you know, yeah. there was something like 200 years of philosophers saying, what is the method of truth seeking that science should follow? You have mm -hmm. historians also, you know, again, maybe not 200 years, but at least 100 plus years of writing mm -hmm. heroic stories of like the successes. And now you finally, uh, you know, in, in the 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, people saying, actually, I want to shift my career and I want to do philosophy as it actually as science actually happens or history of science as it actually happens. So there's a whole literature out there um, that's trying to do in many ways what you already did in chemistry, which is how do you tell stories about the real world? Um, so this is uh, in many ways, I'm curious what you think about this, of this, this move of academia to say, okay, now we're going to tell stories too. And yeah. also maybe, um, in answering the question, um, we had a question from the audience about, from Baldeep, about what sources did you consult? So did you draw on these academics who fancy themselves storytellers or did you look elsewhere? For chemistry? Yes, or for either either book really. No, um, not, you know, I, I think, um, I see it a lot so, sort of in like, in medicine as well, narrative medicine really taking off, sort of using kind of a way of telling stories through the perspective um, with at least a lens or a consideration of science. Um, not really actually for chemistry that sort of just came out of my head in, in this like very jumbled, you know, chaotic couple years that, uh, in my twenties writing that book. Um, and Joan was harder because I, I did have to kind of um, go back into the hospital and do some shadowing and sort of, you know, interviews and things that um, I just couldn't pull from my own head. But I think my ability to kind of bring the things together is just a natural ability of having lived in both the worlds. Um, kind of what um, the audience member was asking, um, sort of one foot in each field um, and trying to find a balance between science and art. It's, it's, it's very hard to find that sort of delicate balance between science and art because so much of art um, doesn't really want to write about science, right? And so much of science thinks, I don't know, the humanities are not rigorous enough or, or something like that. Like there is just this, this kind of like combative aspect of the two fields. But I think when it's done really well, um, it can be quite beautiful and sort of the friction of them can be quite nice. Um, you know, the facts of science, there's something really um, nice about leaning in to the science research that I like but also having the freedom of fiction to sort of add humor um, into it. And that could be nice. But 
No, it, it is actually hard. I actually didn't necessarily have examples to go on. It was just something I knew I really wanted to do. So I will take, take the last three minutes to ask, maybe ask you to um, reflect on this point. So last weekend, this past yeah, weekend, yeah. I went to a symposium sponsored by, I think, University of Bristol. It was called Decoloniality okay. in Literature and Science. Okay. And um, there is a professor who wrote biofictions by Dr. Josie Gill. Okay. And one of her main points, and she was comparing STS interventions in literature. And one of the conclusions I don't think was actually in the questions, I think they forgot about it. But uh, one of the points that she made was um, some, for some reason, um, STS scholars and maybe some science studies people have kind of tried to make another space for themselves. And so they kind of try to colonize the literature department. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I know that like, you're teaching lit literary courses, but do you, yeah. do you teach science courses too? No, 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 no. Um, I, 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 I mean, so after, I mostly just teach creative writing um, mm -hmm. and different types of workshops. Um, and I applied because, you know, with the, with the MFA, um, they, they do train you to teach. Um, I think I, I don't do that much curriculum work at the college level with big classes for science anymore. Um, I used to, but I think it's, it's like slightly different. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really teach, um, like larger science classes. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Well, um, the other, maybe this is just a way to think about references, maybe if you're interested. Uh, jo so Josie also brought up uh, Kath McKittrick's Dear Science and Other Stories. So she's a Black geographer from Canada. Oh, wait, and, what is it? What is it called? It's called Dear Science and Other Stories. Okay. Yeah, so it's a nice um, essay collection. And it's, um, she's actually, Kath McKittrick's actually um, uh, trying to subvert like our tendency to um, empiricize and collect data. So so one of the takeaways that Josie said is maybe people who want to bring in literature into the sciences shouldn't be counting as data, mm. you know, it, they should just exist as is. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Or mm. how can we grapple with this tendency to scientize even the humanities narratives when we try to bring it into the hard science collections? Right. I mean, that's such a, that's such a challenging question. I mean, this, this, this idea of, you know, the um quantizing kind of numbers and sort of putting 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 numbers through literature i i, I sometimes think when i'm when i'm trying to incorporate science into sort of writing um this is there's this essay that i actually taught yesterday with my students that they really liked it's called um joyce Ladoris, and it's about the hummingbird and sort of how that relates to the whale heart and how that relates to human hearts and how um, I think that without any numbers is kind of looking at science through more of a human connection, right? What does science te teach us about living things and how we exist and why we exist um, and balance, right? Energy balance. Um, and, and what does that have to deal with? You know, the human condition, the human heart, the human relationships that we're, we're able to build. Um, so, I, I sort of agree with what you're saying that it's it's it, it it shouldn't be a quantitative or sort of a numbered approach. Um, definitely not, um, because there's uh, there's definitely a coldness to that. Um, but there are so many ways that you know I think scientists or even people in STEM and how they sort of deal with the rigor of they, their work kind of shows us something about I don't know a person at the brink of either a, a crisis or either a moment or breakthrough, right? That kind of feeling the urgency of that. And then what does that really teach us about um, like human yearnings and, and love and, and um, sort of stability. So I, it'll be super exciting to see what you do with this uh, writing real science idea. I know, I'm, I'm, really I'm a little bit really nervous. Fun. I mean, I think, you know, with like, with, with students who just, you never know what you're gonna get when you start to design a class. Yeah. Oh, you, you're telling me. So <laughs> maybe um, just as a la as a last thing, um, is there anything you know about, or you'd like to announce about the Joan is okay when it will be available and um, mm -hmm. our future plans? Sure. Um, so it's out January 18th next year. Um, so 2022, um, and I, I think that's it in terms of like 
anything to announce. Um, I'm probably, well, they'll, they'll probably certainly um, virtual events um, and I'll try to post them on my Instagram, which is Waikiki Wang, uh, or you can find them on my website, which is waikiwangwrites.com. Um, and yeah, just, just you know, I, I, um, I, I look forward to hearing what you guys think about Joan in the second rendition. That sounds great. Maybe we can um, we can come back and talk about it again after, after once sure, you've had those three that. years of break or something. <laughs> three years of break from Joan. <laughs> sure. Well, um, thanks everyone for participating. Thanks especially to Wakey Wong for joining us. I really appreciate you spending time with us. Yeah, of um, course. I'd also like to thank um, our live captioner, Norma McKay and uh, Andrea Wan for the great uh, cover art for our series. So yeah, beautiful. thanks again, everyone. I'll see you next time. Thank you.